Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'll be talking about medical device regulation right, right early on a Friday afternoon. So bear with me, please. I'll try to make it as interesting as possible, but I'm sure your questions will also help me with that. So just to give you some highlight on, on what we'll be, I'll be presenting here today. So just for context, we'll be reviewing a little bit what are the the regulatory um, main uh, issues regarding medical devices and in vitro medical devices. I will present uh, the medical device expert panel's main activities. I will also briefly present you our new project, which is a pilot that we are doing on advice provided to the manufacturers by the expert panel. And in the end, and that's more for us to discuss a little bit uh, on the patients and healthcare professionals uh, involvement in the expert panel's activities. So just for context, um, medical devices cover the definition, cover a huge uh, broad range of products, but I have here the definition for you. So basically the two main aspects that we need to consider for the whether or not to consider a product as a medical device has to do with what it's the intended purpose. So the product he has to have a specific medical purpose that it's defined in the regulation. And also the mode of action needs to be taken into consideration, meaning that it cannot have its principal mode of action being based on any uh, pharmacological, immunological, or metabolic means, uh, uh, in case it would be a, a medicine, of course. Medical devices are structured by risk classes, so from the lowest risk class, the class 1 medical devices, which are generally... Uh, more consumer products use, so the risk is quite low. You, you can be familiarized with most of these devices, so from glasses to wheelchairs. Uh, and then it goes up to class 2A, which would be already a, an intermediate class risk, to the really higher risk classes like class 2B or class 3, the, the highest class risk. It's important to also refer here that unlike the medicines regulation, in the medical devices there are third parties involved in the assessment, which are the notified bodies. The notified bodies are designated by the member states. It can be either private or public entities, and it's for them to do the part of the assessment with the compliance with the European regulation before a device can be placed on the market. The remit of that assessment goes from, uh, um, it only applies to the higher risk products, so it goes from class 2A to 3 and some specific types of class 1 devices, but even then it's not for the whole device itself, it's for a specific part of that device, meaning that, for instance, if it's a class 1 sterilized medical device, the notified body's assessment will only focus on the sterilization process and not the product itself. This, in the same way for in vitro uh, medical devices, the, the definition is also helpful to understand what, what's being covered by the, the remit of this um, regulation. And it's basically a very different types of products. It covers from reagents to calibrators to instruments itself that are intended by the manufacturer to be used for in vitro examination. So in vivo tests are excluded from that definition. And also that it's the samples need to come from the human body. So other sources of, um, of tissue or blood are excluded for this. So, for instance, tests that are specifically destined to be used in veterinary, uh, in a veterinary context, are not included in this um, definition. Uh, 
And then it's for purposes of uh, following up on any physiological or pathological processes or states or any condi congenital conditions or a predisposition to a condition or a disease. So the definition is quite broad on the, on the purposes of the in vitro diagnostic medical devices. So they are covered by two different regulations, the medical device regulation and the in vitro uh, device regulation. The implementation has suffered some backs and forth also with, uh, with the, the, the COVID pandemic. It had to be the full implementation is ongoing, but the end of the transition period has been su successfully um, extended and very recently there was another extension that was um, given to the application because of many aspects that we don't need to cover here today. Regarding the expert panels on medical devices, they were created by uh, both the medical device regulation and the in vitro device regulation and they are, their main function is to provide scientific assessment and advice in the field of medical devices and in vitro medical devices. The panel members are experts in their own field and they are appointed by the European Commission based on a call for expression of interest where it is detailed what are the needs in terms of scientific, clinical and technical expertise that would apply to those experts. Um, the Secretariat for the Expert Panels has been uh, up until one, 1st of March 2022. It was provided by the Joint Research Center, but since then it has transitioned to the EMEA and it's now provided by the Expert Panels and Groups Office where I work. It's organized into 12 different panels, one of which has some specific characteristics and it's called the screening panel and I will elaborate a little bit further on its function uh, after this. So in reality there are 11 thematic panels, one being specifically for in vitro diagnostics. Um, and you can see that the, there is also the support of a central list of available experts that can be called in for specific procedures and all the expert panel's activity is also uh, coordinated by a, a committee where the chairs and vice chairs of all the panels sit. So you can see that there are these are this is organized in clinical areas and some of the clinical areas are quite big so they were reorganized in subgroups as is orthopedics or the circulatory system for instance. The expert panels have two types of activities mandated by the regulation. Some are mandatory activities which are procedures that need to be followed depending on the type of device and some are what we call ad hoc activities meaning that these are activities that can be requested uh, by either the commission or member states. For the first of those mandatory procedures we have what we call the clinical evaluation consultation procedure CECP for short and it's applicable to all class 3 implantable medical devices. I have a few examples here. So these are the highest risk medical devices uh, class and specifically the implantable ones, it adds a, a, an additional layer of risk. Or also in that specific type of products, the class 2B active medical devices destined to administer or remove a medicinal product. This is a specific part of, a, of a, the classification of the regulation. It's uh, the first part of Rule 12 and it covers basically the... Um, so we're talking about dialysis machines, ventilators, uh, infusion pumps. So it's equipment destined specifically to uh, administer or remove 
medicinal products. Mm -hmm. Airways for the class three implantable medical devices. We have a lot of implantable active medical devices for cardiology, for instance, as our pacemakers, ICDs, implantable um, cardioversor defibrillators, IPGs, in, uh, impulse, um, implantable uh, pulse generators, or commonly also called new neurostimulators, for instance, if they are used in the, the neurological uh, setting. Breast implants, it's a special category of implants that was promoted to class 3, as were the joint prosthetics. So the procedure is focused on a specific part of the assessment that is conducted by the notified body. So the notified body assesses what it's provided by the manufacturer as being called the clinical evaluation report, and the notified body produces its own assessment report, which is then called the clinical evaluation assessment report. And it's on that document and the associated documents with it that the expert panels need to provide an opinion. So uh, an opinion, it's a non-mandatory uh, opinion or uh, um, uh, an advice on what was assessed by the notified body. These are publicly available on the Commission's website. I have here the link for you in case you want to check those that are published. Some of them are redacted while the conformity, uh, process, uh, while the conformity assessment process is still ongoing. There is an intermediate phase between the production of an opinion and the submission, which is where the screening panel intervenes. And the screening panel has one function, to determine whether or not an opinion is needed for that specific device. And that is based on three different criteria. One is the level of novelty that the device involves, combined with the possible clinical impact or health impact of that novelty. So just a novelty with no impact, or no, with no clinical impact, would not trigger the need for an opinion. The other two are valid health concerns. So we um, have sometimes these broad um, communications that come from the European Commission regarding, for instance, um, a, a whole group of devices, as was, for instance, the the it is the, the the breast implants. For instance, some types of breast implants are under special surveillance by the, 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 the vigilance group, so we do get that information from them, or we could also get information on a in significant increase of serious incidents that would also trigger a specific uh, need for an opinion on that device. Similarly, for the in vitro medical devices, we have the performance evaluation consultation procedure, so the PECP, and that it's mandatory for all class 3 IVDs, and these can be broadly grouped into two different groups of products. One, it's the, 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 the infectious agents that are either linked to transfusional medicine safety, or the ones that have on its own uh, uh, the possibility of causing a life-threatening disease and they have a high degree of propagation, as was the case with SARS-CoV-2, as is the case with HIV, HPV, HCV, HD, uh, HCV, HDV, I'm sorry, no, I, I, there is a, <laughs> a typo there. Um, and also, for instance, treponema pallidum that comes from that setting of the transfusional medicine safety. And also the IVDs that are uh, determined to be used for five blood group systems, AB0, rhesus, Cal, KID, and Duffy. And even for Cal, it's just one antigen. It's just uh, the major Cal antigen that it's uh, under this. The PCP is, as I've told you, mandatory for all class D IVDs, but it has some specific rules of exemption. Namely, 
if there are already common specifications available for that type of device, common specifications are technical rules for assessment of a type of device that is published as a, a, as a legislative act, meaning that they replace the um, the need for a view, for a view for an advice on that device because it's already published what it's needed for the approval of that specific IVD. And very recently there was the first batch of common specifications was published by the Commission, so a lot of uh, IVDs are now exempted from following this procedure. And also, the way the process was set up is that whenever a type of device that came for this procedure was certified, then the same type of product would not need to come again. So they would just have to have a look at what was published in that advice, which we call in this case for the, the, the IVDs, we call it a view. And then they would be also exempted from following the procedure. Um, so it's an, unlike the CECP that I've just presented to you, here there is no screening phase because if the device meets the conditions and there are no exemptions to the procedure, then it's a, a view is needed. Apart from these mandatory activities, the expert panels have what we call uh, ad hoc activities, which are done in an advisory role. So they advise either the member states to the Medical Device Coordination Group, the MDCG, or the Commission on any issue regarding safety or performance of medical devices. They also contribute to guidance and common specifications, and they also can provide advice to manufacturers of class 3 devices and class 2B active devices, again intended to administer or remove a medicinal product. So the same first part of Rule 12. You've noticed that in this case, for advice to manufacturers, the remit is a little bit broader. So it's not just class 3 implantable medical devices, it's all class 3. And this takes us to what is currently going on. We have an ongoing pilot for scientific advice, specifically focused on this type of product. The submissions is, are currently ongoing. They've started very recently. And we will use this pilot to, uh, in a way, build what will be the final process for uh, scientific advice in the future. So we've decided to take, during this year, 10 scientific advice procedures in two phases. So first we'll take five pilot projects and then after September we'll take another five depending on adaptations that are needed. Um, in case the applications uh, are uh, exceed the number of 10, we will use a selection process to ensure that different areas are covered, but also that specific current needs for devices uh, in the European Union are in a way supported by this pilot project. So we will be specifically targeting devices that are developed to help treat uh, or diagnose um, a, a, a disease or condition that affects a small number of patients, namely what it's commonly call, called the orphan devices, or devices that are uh, used uh, for for in for p uh, developed for pediatric use only. Uh, we'll also be targeting devices that are conceived for unmet medical needs, what the, the guidance calls a breakthrough device, meaning that it's a device for which there are no um, really good alternatives at the moment, or on the opposite the really novel devices where we can have potentially a major clinical or health impact. So we'll also be targeting those and prioritizing those. This is in line with it's called now the, the new policy of the Commission for supporting the transition to the new medical device framework. And you can see here that this pilot project is highlighted as one of the measures that the Commission is promoting 
to help with the development of these high risk medical devices also the the support the specific support to tailored solutions for the development of orphan devices it's mentioned here in the fact sheet so the current pilot project that it's ongoing it is this uh, timeline the timeline the timeline it's still tentative so we'll need to adjust that's why we are having the pilot of course and it started on the 27th of february with the submission of letters of interest where the applicants submit a high level information on what the type of device is what they would like to um, ask in the for the further development and this process will go on until um, until th uh, the end of March, and from in February in April, sorry, we'll start with the selection of the first five applications for this first phase, and then we'll repeat the process at a later phase after September with the adaptations that might be needed then. Just to give you a quick overview of the process, so. All the processes will take place more or less in during 60 days, so the procedure has the duration of 60 calendar days, but it, these might need to be adjusted depending on experts' availability and the nature of the request, of course. But we'll also include a mandatory pre-submission meeting, which is in this case destined specifically to help the applicant prepare the process for the, the scientific advice application, because we understand that in this specific setting for, for medtech uh, industry, mm, some applicants might not be very familiar with the process, so we need to give as much input as needed so that they get the most out of this uh, advice also. Uh, the, currently, the pilot phase is, on, is ongoing without any fees charged to the applicants, so it's quite appealing at this stage. At the end, every procedure will always include a discussion meeting with the applicant to ensure that there is the maximum of input being done before the final advice is produced. And uh, the regulation foresees that the advice should be published, uh, although taking into consideration uh, commercially confidential information, but during the pilot phase, we will we'll not publish any of the advices given. So, and it brings us to this specific topic, which is the patient involvement and <coughs> healthcare professional involvement in the uh, expert panel's activities. And in this particular case, we have a specific article in the medical device regulation where this input is foreseen. So it's article 106.4, where it's mentioned that the expert panel should take into, consider, into account relevant information provided by stakeholders, including patients, organizations, and healthcare professionals, when preparing their scientific opinions. Um, whereas for healthcare professionals, probably that input comes already from the nature of the expert panels and how it's composed. I've grouped here for your information how more or less it's what, what is the background of uh, these experts. And for instance, the vast majority are medical experts, which are active practitioners currently. Most of them are active surgeons in their field, and they are members of academia and or scientific and clinical societies. We have 25 members of the IVD panel, which is a very specific type of expertise that combines technology with infectious disease epidemiology, and they are also members of academia and uh, clinical and scientific societies. And then we have more or less around what we call technical experts, so from very specific types of technology to uh, methodology, for instance, and they cover all types of medical technology in a more specific sense so that they are not in a specific, they are sometimes in a specific panel, but they provide input that it's sometimes more general, like is in methodology, for instance. Whereas to collect patients and healthcare professional inputs, there is already in place a vigilance system that is set up at national level by member states. So 
they collect a lot of what is the current experience with medical devices, especially associated with incidents, meaning serious uh, inj injuries caused or potentially caused by medical devices or associated to its use. So both patients and healthcare professionals have a very active role uh, in setting up and keeping these systems uh, running. Manufacturers are also a very important part in these systems. And we are currently liaising with the expert group at the commission where these uh, issues are after they were analyzed by the member states where they are then discussed at a, a further at a higher level and then we'll try to liaise with them to collect this information for our consultation procedures but it's also possible that we identify specific groups or categories of devices where specific a specific need of input might be needed so that's also something we are considering asking our experts which types of products in general would benefit from general input either from patients or from healthcare professionals so that could also be a way forward and that concludes my presentation and i'm open to your questions thank you so much <laughs>